Hey guys, it's Ben the Coin Geek at Old Public Coin, and today we have a pretty long video for you, but hopefully for you diehard uh, numismatic folks, you'll enjoy this. It is from the Eric P. Newman, the Newman Numismatic Porthole. Uh, they do uh, symposiums twice a year, currently twice a year, and this was a live event that happened a few weeks back, and a lot of people weren't able to watch it because of the time of day or, you know, just yada, yada, yada. And this is easier because it's right here on YouTube. So pop some popcorn, have a beer, whatever it is you want to do, and sit back as I recount for you the current history of the coin market and then moving forward in the future what the coin market might hold. And there's a Q&A at the end, which is kind of fun just to kind of hear people's questions and thoughts on things. All right, guys, roll film. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the NNP Symposium for this fall. Um, this is, I believe, our seventh NNP Symposium, which is wild to think back on, but we're very excited to have you all here bright and early this morning uh, for Ben's presentation. <laughs> um, so Ben's going to be talking about changing coin markets. Um, he is passionate about coin collecting, history, and humanity. And if you recognize him, it is likely from his YouTube channel, The Coin Geek, uh, which explores collectible coins, currency, ephemera, and historical items while having fun with history and other hobbyists. Um, so he'll be speaking. Um, and then if you have any questions, you're welcome to send them in at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. All of them will be shared anonymously at the end of the presentation. So you can send them in at any point, but we will actually ask them at the end. Um, so I think that's all that I have. Ben, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Leanna. Let's make sure that you can hear me still. I think. Okay. Yep, I'm getting you're coming the, through. I'm I'm getting the the good the good nod here from Leanna. So, um, thank you to the uh, to the Newman uh, Numismatic Portal for uh, having me here. And uh, of course, as people know, you save the best for last, so you make the worst go first. This is uh, one of the truisms of life. Uh, in today's topic. Um, we're going to start with something a little bit more philosophical, but also related to the market itself uh, for anyone who collects coins, because it's a type of question that I've had um, the entire time I've been doing coins, uh, you know, what's going on with the markets. So we're going to talk a little bit about that first, um, just to mention, for those of you who have either heard my voice because you watch videos on YouTube or maybe had to look at me, uh, I have a channel called The Coin Geek, but also we have a full-time brick and mortar store in Tucson called Old Pueblo Coin. And I've been doing this for 25 years uh, in the store. And then before then, for a decade as a kid, uh, collecting collecting coins. And so uh, what I bring is a little bit of a historical perspective. And that's really what we're going for in general uh, with this conversation is just having a historical perspective when we look at the uh, the changing coin markets and and what it means. And of course, we've got our little buddy here saying, you know, what me worry. So let me talk a little bit about what this uh, conversation is not. This conversation is not a predictor of markets or trying to tell you how to time the markets. Um, it is, uh, you know, in, in no way am I trying to recommend any type of specific action based on just commentary here. We just want to have an open conversation and dialogue um, about about where the market has been, uh, where it is kind of currently and possibly where it could go. Secondarily, it is also not me talking about um, things as though I don't worry uh, or I don't know how to worry because as someone who has a brick and mortar shop and has to think about payroll and stuff, I worry probably all too much. So it, it gave me a lot of time to think about these coin markets and, and what happens and where we've been. Uh, this conversation is especially for anyone who's newer to the coin market, uh, someone who's joined us since the COVID uh, like bubble, if you will, um, when we had a, a big group of people join back into the hobby. Also, um, that's any age, but you know, also especially for all the YNs out there that I watch and see who on a pretty, pretty regular basis are very active in the coin market, but have only been active really since, since COVID. All right. Uh, so first, we need to talk a little bit about uh, what the coin market looked like 25 years ago uh, and then compare it to where it's kind of come, how it's got here 
and then looking into the future a little bit about uh, where it could possibly be. Uh, so the coin market itself, 25 years ago, if you think about it, uh, for some of us, that seems like yesterday. Uh, and when you when you look at how people dealt with coins, uh, how they traded coins, collected coins, uh, how the coin market was, um, what it was made up of, really you had the major outlets of coin shops, coin shows, you had uh, your numismatic uh, magazines. And uh, after that, of course, there's always been those telemarketers that would run around and, uh, and cause problems within the marketplace. But for the most part, your coin clubs, your coin shows, uh, your coin dealers, and um, your uh, would be the main ways that coins would get traded. And then, and then comes along this thing when we uh, finally got the algorithm right, and we opened up the little lockbox, and what we find is the internet. And then with that internet comes uh, this thing called eBay. Now, some of you remember living through the eBay days when eBay first started and everything that you put on the Internet went for stupid money at first, because first adopters for everything are kind of like that. They're kind of crazy. So all of your first adopters, they're all in. And so they're bidding up stuff and the market's going up on stuff. And then eventually people are like, man, I don't have to go to a coin show or a coin shop. And you saw this a lot with antiques. I don't have to take my Beanie Babies to my antique dealer. I can just put them on eBay. Well, what happened was everyone who owns Beanie Babies put them all on eBay at the same time. And the market goes. And that happened with parts of the coin market, too, where you started to see where when you when you took down the barricades and you made coins available everywhere to everyone all the time you really saw a change in the coin market. And that was one of the big changes over the last quarter century was that first rise of the internet, that first wave, that first wave of eBay. Um, you saw a lot of the auction companies that had previously held auctions just uh, at the major shows. So they were putting out like five big catalogs a year. Maybe sometimes they do a specialty niche catalog. But what they would do, what they ended up doing is they found, okay, we got to get a website going. And there was a lot of doubt in this. Like I've I've heard uh, interviews with the guys who've created some of these huge, well-known corporate, you know, auction houses. And they had huge doubts about the internet. They're like, what is this? What are we, what are we doing? Of course, now that's that's where most of their bids come from for their major auctions is going to be from online online bidding you know and they didn't see that coming and this is going to be a reoccurring theme when we talk about the coin market we don't see it coming right we don't really know where we're going to end up next uh so we go from just having to be at a local coin shop or club meeting you know your monthly club meeting or local club show to being able to be at home put stuff online. There's a whole lot more of what they might call a customer to customer in business world. It's like B2B business to business, you know, and then there's client to client, C to C. But really that happened previously, like at coin shows and at, uh, at your coin club, but now it's happening all the time online. And you're seeing more and more of it, more and more of it, which is starting to make the coin market feel a little heavy. And by that, I mean, a lot of the dealers are starting to feel like they are left out of the loop because there are new loops. There are new ways to sell within the overall coin ecosystem. And so that change in that adaptation, if you weren't ready for it or if you didn't adjust to it, it really affected you as a dealer. Now, as a collector, it opened up lots of new opportunities for you because you could reach new people. And if you wanted to, you could retail stuff yourself instead of having to go to your local shop at a wholesale level and, you know, do, do work that way. So you go from eBay and what you start to see is a little bit less of an emphasis on coin shows uh, and a lot more people shopping from home. Now, now think about that 2010 to 2020 window. 
right? This is this is a window of time when, you know, you had the rise in bullion after the 06, 07, 08 housing bubble, and the bullion starts going up 9, 10, 11. The coin market's moving with it for the most part. And then from 12 to 20, 21, somewhere in there, you start to see a decline of traditional ways to do coins. And so for guys who've been doing coins for 20 or 30 years, they're looking around at coin shows and they're seeing fewer people show up. And they start to have this collective mentality of the coin market is dying. And in fact, I'm old enough to remember 2019 before COVID when most dealers, if I talked to them and they went to coin shows, they would say, we're going the way of the stamp market. No offense to our philatelic friends out there, but they're going the way of the stamp market and we're just not going to be around. There's not going to be any more. What are we going to do? It's all bullion, right? That was that was the spirit of the time, 2019. So you look at March of 2020 and here comes COVID. And uh, God bless us all for you know making it through. I mean, I didn't know it was going to happen. I was stressed out, like, what are we going to do? How are we going to do business anymore? Uh, can I afford to pay my employees? It was a rough time. For and most of us know that. None of us could have predicted what would happen next. None of us could have predicted, hey, uh, you're going to see a resurgence in your hobby. Uh, people who were not moving to an online platform were forced to. So there's a lot of businesses that really benefited from it because they're like, hey, you know, we've never been online, but we have no option now. Let's figure this out. Uh, and and let me talk a little bit about the benefit to the consumer, which may seem odd when you have a you know rising prices, but you know, to the consumer, one of the things we talk about on the coin channel here, the Coin Geek channel, is uh, coin deserts. And this is something that I take for granted because in Tucson there's always been several coin shops. But as I look around the country, I find more and more that there's a whole lot of people out there that don't have a brick and mortar store where they can go in and talk to somebody and look at coins on a regular basis. And that's that's a whole lot of people. So all of a sudden you had more and more of this business getting pushed onto the internet, but not onto the internet. Now something else happened between 2015 and today. And that's like this, this thing here, this little phone thing with apps. Lots of lots of different types of social media apps. So what else happened is the formation of what I kind of call the invisible coin market. And it's invisible to a lot of us who are probably older than me, because I'm a little bit old for my age, but like for a lot of people um, who are older than I am and they're in the coin market, uh, they may have never got onto um, Twitter, which I heard is called something else now. And uh, maybe they've never been on Instagram. Maybe they're on Facebook and they have Facebook groups. Maybe they've never heard of like some of the other selling platforms that are out there, like a whatnot or, or some of these other places people are trying to sell stuff. Uh, and what happened is it, when coins were on eBay and the dealers moved to eBay and collectors moved to eBay, they saw a lot of the transition because it was kind of like, okay, here's all of my traditional platforms. And there's eBay. Now, the social media stuff hadn't really kicked in yet. And then you get to Facebook and there's Facebook groups. But even then, that didn't really catch on, I think, for a while. And then all of a sudden, you go straight from that to having all these people trading back and forth on, on Instagram. And unless you're there to see it happening, it's, it's an invisible market. And it's an invisible market to anyone who is in a more traditional setting. That's for dealers or collectors. So if you're a dealer or you're a collector, and you're sitting back uh, and you're not on some of these other platforms, you don't see any of this tr any of these transactions happening. Uh, and then comes this thing called YouTube. And with YouTube, people can actually enjoy coin content from home, even if they're living in a coin desert. They can watch coin related vid videos that are for them just relaxing or entertaining. Or they can do business with people that way also, right? Or, you know, they can uh, learn more about the coins because 
one of the nice things about YouTube being so visual is you can actually take time to look at coins and explain what you have there. Uh, and, and so it's really been a place where unlike some of the other platforms with Facebook or, or Instagram, where a lot of it is just like, here's a picture, it's for sale. You know, you can actually engage in the hobby again. And that's really, a, really a wonderful thing. Um, so you've actually gone into a place where you're starting to see more and more engagement in the hobby. Now, I'm seeing the engagement, but once again, this is an invisible market for a lot of people. Unless you are actively in those marketplaces or on those social media platforms, you don't see any of it happening, right? It's like, if you've never been to a Comic-Con, they don't exist to you, right? There's like nobody there. Now, now I want you, if you're in a major metropolitan area, just go ahead and go to the next Comic-Con. For those of you who don't know what a Comic-Con is, it's basically where people, uh, they, they fan over fanboy or fangirl over um, things that are related to either movies or comics or video games. And oftentimes they dress up as the characters. You go down there and it's like the whole city's there. And you're like, oh, I didn't know this existed. So here we are in a place where we have a much more diverse, much more diverse platform for uh, coins than we used to. The entire coin ecosystem is much more broad than it used to be. And it was always large because you were talking about, well, do you collect coins? Oh, okay, great. I collect coins too. Oh, really? You know, what, what do you do? Oh, oh, there's more than one type of coin? What? Civil War tokens? Oh, only from Ohio. Oh, okay. Oh, so only settler tokens. Oh, how far do you want to go down any rabbit hole in coin collecting? And it's just, it's such a broad, broad spectrum. And now what you can do is if you collect something very, very esoteric or niche, you get to have a community around you of other people that collect those and you can find those people and really enjoy your hobby together. So the things that came out of COVID that have been really monumental for us is the broadening and deepening of the market. Uh, for me in my lifetime, we're seeing, I think, the broadest, deepest market we've ever seen. And what I mean by that is the number of people who are actually engaged in the marketplace and the age range is larger. And, you know, there's, of course, always the, the running joke of the gender gap in coins. But I'm super excited when I go to coin shows to see people that are not only new to the hobby, but you see young families showing up. And I have more and more female clients that that's what they love and they've got their thing that they enjoy. And to me, that's all very, very encouraging. And what it means to me is that in the long term, you're going to have stability in the market, a different type of stability. Now, you might not always see that stability because if you only do one thing, if you only go to coin shows, for example, and maybe there's a rough economy. Right, maybe things happen in the world around us we can't control, and then when you look at that, that can that can look bad on the outset, and it can affect the marketplace. It can affect what does that mean? Affect the marketplace. It can affect pricing, and people get all scattered about pricing, right? So, uh, and so when people talk about a bad economy or a struggling coin market or what's going to happen, my CC dollars were $400 and now they're 300, what are we gonna do? You gotta remember that those same Carson City dollars were $175 four years ago, right? So they went from 200 to 400, they're back to 300. That's, that's, that's the type of thing that I consider that people worry about that I don't know that we should worry about. And of course there's multiple, multiple perspectives to look at here because you've got your, your own perspective if you're a collector and depending on where you are in your collecting time period you may say i don't want my coins to go down in value right that can, i understand that i do i do but also i was having a conversation with someone about this topic and uh, we we're talking about how there's a lot more people in the market so there's more competition so prices are a little stiffer right at this point in time and his comment was you know I could use a few less coin collectors because he wants to be able to buy his stuff at a cheaper level. So can we just talk about how if coins go on sale, maybe we should be happy about that as a consumer, having less competition? I think the big fear that everyone has 
is that commentary that we heard so much of in the late 20 teens, which is we're going the way of the dodo bird. We're going the way of the stamp market. You know, there's not going to be any buyers, any collectors anymore. Uh, and that is the, the, the longevity for generations is something to consider very different than my inventory dropped in value because the market shifted on me. Those, I think, for, for any of us, we very naturally think about tomorrow and today, but we don't necessarily think about 5 and 10 and 15 years out. So if some of you have been around long enough to remember what the gray sheet used to look like, do you, do you remember? This is a 2012 gray sheet. And we had, uh, by the way, the printing on these is getting smaller every year. Every year I look at these things. Uh, you know, gold was at 1700 Platinum was at 1600 Does anyone remember platinum at 1600 You know, I, I certainly uh, do, but it helps to get a reminder. Did the end of the world come because platinum is $1,000 instead of $1,600? You know, is it the end of the world when markets shift on you? And once again, I understand if you're if you if your main concern is just about making money, this is one of the reasons why I talk about uh, coin collecting as a hobby instead of as an investment. Because if your whole goal is money oriented instead of you know money oriented, of course that's not a coin. That's my what me worry guy here. If it's if it's not oriented towards the hobby, you're you're gonna be uptight about the changing coin markets. What happens when? What happens when? What happens when? Now, some of you remember back. Now, I don't know if there's many of you remember back shopping with some of the old school guys that this is no one remembers shopping this old, right? But you get to go through books like these and magazines like these and see stuff and understand, okay, the market changed. You know, collect uh, dealers don't dealers don't put out publications like this anymore. You might see really nice auction catalogs, but a really nice pamphlet that someone's going to be able to cook, like basically a book that a collector can look through, like the Sears Roebuck catalog that you can hold and go through. Well, all of that has been modified to now where it's it's on your phone, it's on your computer. So the market itself is in a lot of different places than it used to be. But in a lot of ways, I think the market is healthier. So I want to close with a couple of different thoughts on um, the eternal good things about coin collecting, the timeless truths, if you will. So uh, I had an old timer who used to tell me, you know, well, I've never known a broke coin collector. And what his comment was, uh, it was to the point that you, you always had something to fall back on if you absolutely needed it. And I've seen this over and over again. I've seen where people have to sell off their coin collection for something else. I've seen people sell off their coin collection to support their grandma because grandma was more important than their coins. And maybe that's a perspective we should think about. When it comes to um, actual details on coin collecting, one of the things I found most fascinating from a couple of different interviews that I watched was an interview from a coin show in 2012 where a lot of the dealers were somewhat lamenting the fact that the market wasn't as busy or robust as it had been three or four years previous. But they were also saying it's still hard to get really good material. And then I listened to a, an interview from uh, 2018, 2019, when the coin market was in that, oh, we're all going to die phase. And here's this dealer saying, I can't get enough good stuff. I can't get enough good stuff. So um, there will always be a premium on quality. And that may mean different things in different price points. Uh, we all collect in different price points. Some of us like our $10 items. Some of us like our you know, $10,000 items. We all like our million dollar items, but we can't all afford them. So, uh, but collecting, the idea behind collecting when you really get into your hobby, when you really take the time to study your coins, you start to distinguish the difference between quality and average, 
and you start to understand the difference between you know rarity and common in a way that you wouldn't have known before if you weren't really active in your hobby. For those of you who are um, not as familiar with some of these other places you can go I, I, to, to collect coins and be with people, I my favorite thing about coin, the coin industry, the coin ecosystem, is just that there's so many awesome people in it. Uh, and there's so many people that are willing to give and you can learn from. And it doesn't really matter if you're in, uh, you know, the middle of nowhere. You can find communities, whether it's a Facebook group or it's on Instagram or it's through YouTube. You can find community. And uh, I still highly, highly recommend anyone who, to anyone who hasn't been out, get to a coin show once a year. Just make it kind of an annual trip. You know, if, if for you, traveling is a far ways to go. You know, that's something that I would recommend you do. Uh, get out, be a part of community. I'm just seeing if I had any special notes that I forgot to talk about here. Um, you know, so even if even if we go through a down market, which, you know, we, we'll go through more down markets. You know, I, I still predict a long term stability of the coin market because of the ability to have more and more collectors at a higher and higher participation level. And that might not mean a monetary participation level. But if you go through personal hard times coming up, you can still be an active member of the coin community. You can still go to your local club, participate in YouTube videos, or you know, just enjoy things on Instagram or TikTok or wherever. God help you, TikTok, wherever you may, wherever you may consume coin related education information and entertainment all right so i'm going to stop and let uh leanna come on back and see if we've got any questions worth questioning about <laughs> all right so we do have a few in the q a already um for anyone else if you have questions go ahead and send them in and we'll work down the list for as many as we have Sounds um, good. so let's see um do you think AI will be used by third-party grading to help with their businesses to potentially grade points faster? Um, yes, the, I, they already do. They have for a while. In other words, um, I know that it's been years ago since PCGS has set up systems where they identify coins electronically to see if a coin's already been through this system before. Mm -hmm. So I know they're doing that. Um, I'm sure they have all kinds of things in the works that they haven't really led on to, which is fine. Um, and I, I actually am in favor of, uh, zero humans ever grading silver eagles or modern coins. Like, what's the point of that? You can scan Tron that sucker. Like I have my doubts about, um, well, let me put it this way. AI is not going to replace human grading, but it can be a tool. And I think that it can be a good tool. But uh, that's when I think about older classic numismatic items, AI is not going to be a foundation of like how they do everything or how we do everything, but it'll be a part just like anything else, uh, you know, just like a microscope is a part of like a tool that can be used to make sure when you look close at something, you can, you can see all the detail, details. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's another one in here in the same vein. So we're just going to knock out the AI questions. The AI um, but, I thought you were going to ask if I am AI. That would have been more appropriate. <laughs> By the way, this is entirely an AI stim stimulated uh, conversation. That's it. Pretty simple. <laughs> um, are there any other ways in which you see AI impacting coin collecting in the coin market? So I have. So here's the concerns, right? I mean, there's there's almost all of these things that are. Uh, a tools like we talked about COVID was like crappy and a blessing at the same time, right? There's two sides to stuff. Um, I, my major concerns for AI have a whole lot to do with the nefarious side of things, which is to say like how quickly can computers manipulate markets and then how quickly can they manipulate the elderly? One of my, um, uh, least favorite sections of 
of the entire industry, and some people consider it just outside of the industry, is uh, the telemarketing stuff that goes on where you have people taking advantage of the elderly. Um, and I have no problem with people setting up their businesses and business model. Like I'm here for the hobby and I make money both. Guys who are just out there to make money. Okay, well, all right. I Different kind of vibe, but whatever. But guys that are out there to lie to people and take advantage of them, that's a whole nother, a whole nother realm. And the problem with AI is you can, you really can manipulate voices. And, you know, the ability to to call people with fake voices is alarming. So um, so there, there's those type of things where I th- you the elderly need to be protected, uh, you know, through education, but also family members. Watch out. I mean, if if you see someone in your family who's elderly start to have coins show up at their house, you need to make sure that you're kind of involved and find out what's what's going on there. I don't know that I actually answered the question. <laughs> um, we, the question please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we started off at, um, are there other ways in which you see AI impacting the coin industry and collecting? Yeah, I think, I think sort of the other side of it, um, there's definitely opportunity for really good educational material to be produced uh, using AI. Um, once again, my, my, my concerns and queries over, over the computer world uh, that we're going into is, uh, if, if robots are taught to pull information that they find from different locations, is there anything that's going to have them check and make sure that information is accurate? In other words, if you search for something on the internet, your first page full of stuff is probably all propaganda and, or like paid for advertising when you really wanted to get an answer. And so, uh, and on top of that, I don't know if you've ever done this, but if you look at um, uh, the responses you get and it'll be like six different websites and then you go to read the article and then you go to read the next article and the next article, they're identical, they're verbatim, the same thing. And so that's, you know, my concern is, and this is why I always recommend books you know, the historical perspective is really good for coin collectors. In other words, the, yes, some of the modern stuff that's out there is going to have more up-to-date and better information at times, but at least I can tell where I'm getting my my source from. Whereas even with the modern internet, not even getting into new AI concerns, um, you know, you just don't know exactly what you're seeing or reading. Um, One of the things that I neglected to mention also is just like with the community, it's very helpful always, always to be involved with people that are um, just on your side, so to speak. So whether that's a a mentor, you know, collector mentor, um, or actually there's like a bazillion really good dealers in this industry who actually care about, you know, teaching you um, and not swindling you. It's, It's actually, I think, very different than it was when I was a kid. I think that there's a whole lot less of the BS that there used to be when I was younger. All right. Uh, moving away from AI. Personally, I prefer live coin shows. How do you feel about the future of coin shows? Do you see growth or contraction of that venue? So I think coin shows are um, really an interesting topic because the there's so many models, right? Like there's your local like five hour coin club on a Sunday. And it's like once a month show and the tables are like 75 bucks or whatever. And, and then, you know, there's a certain amount of material that you'll see there, but there's a lot of stuff you probably won't see there, if that makes sense. And then you go to shows that are kind of regional shows or uh, that might be the tables may cost, you know, 200 to $500 a table, pretty big, pretty big difference, but you'll have a 50 dealers, 75 dealers, and you'll have a lot more material to look at. And then you have like your mega shows that everyone goes to, right? So like your fun show in Long Beach and Baltimore and the A&A. And uh, I don't know exactly what the future holds for them. I will say if everyone shows up to coin shows, they'll keep happening. The coin shows, I think, are very susceptible to um, overall economic pressures. So in other words, as long as everyone who collects coins is not affected by anything bad in the overall economy, then we can all just go on with our day. 
right? And if you think about it, what people worry about is the market's going to crash because like, oh man, remember this and this and this, all this bad stuff happened. But the reality is, okay, so during the Great Recession in 2008 or whatever, that disaffected a lot of people. But at the same time, you know, there was like 90% of the people that it kind of didn't really affect the same way as the other 10%. So in theory, we can keep a lot of the coin shows going, going well. Um, I have a personal preference, which is I think that I think that uh, of course support your local little coin club shows naturally, but also I think that regional shows, um, in my opinion, are kind of a nicer vibe than the the giant shows are, uh, and the giant shows are cool because you can see million dollar coins, and I mean you can see some killer stuff. So as, as a as a collector, as a hobbyist, you got to get down to one of these shows sometime, right? It's like going to Disneyland. You got to go once, right? So you, you go to the Florida uh, show or Baltimore so you can see things you can't see anywhere else. But if you want to go shopping as a collector and you've got, you know, 300 dealers in a room that's the size of three football stadiums, you, mo- most collectors, if they haven't been to shows, get overwhelmed at a little, little local, you know, 30 table club show. And so, you know, that's harder to do. And also from the dealer perspective, if you're one of 300 dealers, that's great that 5,000 people went to this coin show. Were you able to do any business while you were there is very different from. So I, I kind of think that um, all the shows are very different and have different uh, high points and challenges to them. Um, I kind of have my preference for that kind of middle size show myself. Uh, as far as, as long as to the question, which was actually about whether or not coin shows are going to go the way of the dodo bird. Um, I think that you could start to see some changes towards different size shows, depending on how things work out for the, what I call the big boys, like the guys that, you know, when you have all the auction houses and the grading companies, they're obviously the ones supporting the bigger shows. And it's a big spend for them, but it gets a lot of people to come in the door. But if they decide, hey, we don't want to support these shows anymore, a lot of those shows are going to have a harder time sustaining, I think. But they, you know, well, I I'm a I'm a fan of I'm a fan of coin shows. I think that people should attend them, you know, kind of regularly just to enjoy the hobby and be in community. Um, once again, I'm not predicting. I'm not predicting the end of the world on any of this because, you know, we're going to have bad economic times and shows will struggle. Dealers will struggle. Collectors will struggle. But also, you know, then then the sun will come out tomorrow and I'm not going to sing. I'm just not. Well, alrighty. I've only used Facebook. If I wanted to get more involved with audiences online as a dealer, how would you recommend I get started with social media? Oh, that's a good question. How to get started in social media? Uh, well, for the dealer asking the question, you know, I, I, there's a little bit of a question whether or not they have a brick and mortar shop, if they have an office space, or if they only do shows, right? And so that'll kind of affect the answer a little bit. Um, if you get onto Instagram, create an Instagram account. It's super easy to download the app and just start looking around. Um, at how other people use it. In other words, you can actually learn pretty simple by observation, especially on on that platform. Um, Ian Russell created something called My Collect, which is like the Facebook version of uh, it's the coin version of Facebook. So basically, it it functions a little bit like Facebook, but also if you go to mycollect.com, you can sign up there, and that is a coin community without all the other stuff like we're not posting pictures of vacation we're not talking about politics we're just doing coins that's a good place to also kind of meet some people um i think when it comes to social media i am uh, a firm believer in in just being yourself and just raw honesty about what you're doing and what's happening um I I don't follow the face the, the YouTube trends of we're going to make everything like really bold and audacious, I'm the opposite of that, and that's really worked for me. And I will say that 
um, what the consumer doesn't want to see is what you don't want to see. Do you want to watch someone hype a bunch of stuff up and give you no quality information? And the answer is, of course not. Well, then don't do that yourself. You know, put out put out content that you would watch. Um, if you have a specialty area, then hone in on that. I mean, cover broad areas too, but like if you can really hone in, like if you really know, you know, uh, whatever, early American paper money, right? Then specialize in that and don't get discouraged if you only have a few amount of views. The other advice on anything social media is avoid the dopamine hit. The dopamine hit is I got to see, I got to see, I got to see how many people watch that. How many people did I get? Did I get, did I get views? Did I get, you've got to pretend that doesn't exist. So make content that is, uh, that, that you would want to watch yourself and avoid chasing numerics. Just put out, go for quality. All right. Uh, Then we have a similar question coming, I think from more the collector side. How do you find these online groups of collectors with similar interests? So uh, if you start searching for anything um, on any given platform, then the all all the algorithms will show you, hey, you're searching for coins. We're going to show you more coin-related materials. My first step is if you're someone who's not already on social media platforms of any kind, you may want to sit down. Uh, this is age age relevant dependent probably. So, but if you're not on these platforms, so you don't have experience with them, I would say talk to someone who has experience with them. So, like, I will talk to my teenagers about stuff. If I'm doing something like, hey, how did you how do you edit for this type of video for Instagram? Because I don't, I mostly do YouTube myself, and I'm on Instagram. So, but I will ask someone who knows, right? So. If you're um, not familiar and you happen to have kids or grandkids, ask them about Instagram, especially TikTok's a little cray cray. I'm not ready to go go there quite yet. I'll, I'll get there, but like I need one thing at a time. So, and then on Facebook also, if you are on Facebook and start searching for coins, uh, you'll find different communities on there. But what I'd recommend is finding people that you know that are already active in those areas. So whether it's uh, so if you're in an area where you have a coin club and you have other people that collect also besides yourself, that that's always the number one thing to do is like have the conversation. Hey, Joe, are you on Facebook? Do you do this? How does that look for you? You know, because also you want to have someone walk you through the pitfalls, pitfalls that you can run into, because as much as, you know, we've had a more connected, robust um, community because of these things there's also of course new snipers that can come in just like we talked about with the ai and stuff there's there's bad there are still bad players out there that if you're not familiar with how they do things you need some education on that all right um i think this is relating more to your shop in tucson um how much of your business is online versus over the counter um we do a lot more online business than we used to. Um our website functions pretty okay now and I I don't want to say I curtail my purchasing to that audience but kind of I do like I I like having a pretty broad spectrum of items available at different price points. I kind of like having coins that are you know, hundred dollar and under when I can. That are nice coins, slabbed coins, and then also, of course, it's 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 all over the place. Um, I will say that, you know, the in the in shop versus the online versus the going to shows, you know, it, it's kind of hard to relate because you kind of have different markets, right? So one of the reasons why eBay was always so successful is because you have all of the eyeballs. Right. So in my store, I have whatever number of people that come into my store. Right. And then my website, you know, and then like, but eBay is still behemoth. And I hate the fact that that's where things go. But I'll put a coin up on our on our website and on eBay. It'll go both places at the same time. And we charge more for the coin on eBay because we got to pay our eBay fees. 
And the stinking thing will sell on eBay. I'm like, you could have bought it for cheaper on our website. And but but the point is, you know, if you think about just the size of the number of eyes on on the ball, so to speak, this num- the number of eyeballs will affect the amount of sales that you have in different areas. Thanks for the question. All righty. Um, do you have any thoughts on the currency market? It seems to be hot. Or um, how about the ancient coin market? So a couple. Oh man, a couple things there. <laughs> so uh, I, I was about to say thanks for the you know the question, Dan, but I don't know who it is. But uh, but like um, I uh, so the paper money market is fun. Like so, always, always, I I come from the hobbyist perspective because that's what I grew up with, and so at times I forget I'm a dealer. And uh, I love paper money. Um, the history of early U.S. paper money is just fascinating. The artwork on paper money amazing. The hard part about U.S. the U.S. paper money marketplace is if you want to collect large size type notes, there's like a dozen notes that are fairly affordable, and then after that, if you want to buy the classics, it's like for the coin to relate it to coins, it's like every item there is an 09 SVDP. It's like, oh, you want to buy a coin with a bison on it? Okay, do you have 500 bucks for one that you can't quite see the bison on? Same thing with the chief, you know, oh, I got to get a battleship. I got to get a lazy deuce. Also, fun fact, uh, paper money has more nicknames than anything else. Like every one of those notes, I just used the nickname for. Um, Long term, it's it, so once again, long term, it's all about supply and demand at the end of the day. If, if, you, if the question has to actually do with price points, um, to my friend's lament about having too many collectors in the marketplace, I feel that for like the currency buyer, like, you know, the good news is like, if you are savvy, you can actually buy stuff online on eBay and from time to time, get a deal on it. If you are a hunter, but you also have to be savvy. So I don't recommend if you're a new collector, I don't recommend you get onto eBay and you just go willy nilly. You know, if you, if you have a lot of experience, you can uh, the ancient market, I think, is just still in lots of ways in its infancy. Uh, the more and more guys that get exposed to the ancients, the more and more people will, I think, go into that market area. Um, I have a lot of uh, ancient dealer friends that still prefer raw coins, but I think that the certification of ancients is just a windfall for that entire marketplace because, um, it, like, people don't know where to start when they look at an ancient coin. And when you have a label that actually gives you all the details on what the coin is, all of a sudden they're like, okay, I know what it is. I can look at it. I can study it. And to me, that just really helps the market in general. Um, so as far as if, if there's some type of question about long-term, well, maybe you can tell me if there's any questions about long-term investing plans, because that's a whole other it, that's a that's a whole other issue. But I do like both of those markets for like just long term, you know, things that if you're buying them now in 20 or 30 years, you're going to look up and say, you know what, I actually made money on this item. You know, if that if that's the question. Yeah, I don't see any any questions in here right now about long term investing. Um, but if anyone would like to know, feel free to send it in and we'll come back to it. Um. Okay, there's one in here. Um, I'm going to read it off verbatim and then read what I think it's trying to ask. And whoever sent this in, if I am misunderstanding, please send it in again and rephrase. Um, As sent in, it reads, what are the commonest people to coin exchanges? Which I believe is asking, um, like, what is your typical in-store customer like? Do you get a lot of serious collectors or more Joe off the street wandered in? (laughs) So different, you know, different regions have very different types of coin collecting markets. So there are towns like if you talk to dealers who do shows that they they'll just say this is a coin town, right? Like like um and and they'll have completely different vibes. So when I did the Denver show, uh the Denver show, it's almost all entirely US material, which is interesting. But then if you go to like El Paso or Albuquerque, both coin towns you can you can find a whole lot of world material, and so my my point is that um, Tucson is a pretty good coin town. In other words, there's a lot of shops. The club is very active, and so that's kind of a I think a leading indicator 
Like, so when I was at Denver, I met all kinds of people that are, I knew were from the coin club and talked to them. And you can tell that they have a strong coin hobbyist centric, you know, community there. And Tucson is like that. So we have a lot of locals that come in the door. Uh, also, um, we have plenty of people who, I mean, traditionally, if you're a coin collector and you're on a road trip, you're looking up the coin shops because you want to see something that's new or different or find something different. So, um, it, you know, if you're if you're on a major interstate, which we are, so we do get people who, if they're going uh, to Cali from anywhere east, uh, coming through the south portion. So if they're coming down the twenty or the ten all the way across the country, uh, the interstate, they'll they can swing in and stop by and look at the local uh, local coin shops. Um, so. Uh, we get a lot of very good local activity in the in the coin market here. Righty. Are collectors today more knowledgeable about their collections than 25 to 50 years ago? Do they know how to grade or do they rely on third-party grading services? Do they know the pedigrees and the history of their collections, et cetera. Oh, boy. Yeah, yes and no. <laughs> so I, I'm glad that they asked all the different angles on that question at the same time. So. Uh, are, are they more knowledgeable about the material? I, I think they're, they're more, there's more information about the material. Um, and I do meet a lot of people who are very well versed in their specific area of collecting. Um, so in, in a way, I do think that you're starting to see people as they get into their little niche that they enjoy and they're able to, because of, because of the internet and social media, connect with other collectors, those guys are constantly educating one another. So I'm thinking of very niche market things. In the very broad spectrum, when you're talking about, like, if if you think the US coin market is just like Morgan dollars and Lincoln cents, and the question is, what about grading? The, the third party grading system has done to coin collectors what the calculator has done to the average American mathematician, right? Like, the cal like, I I um tell people that you got to learn how to how to understand what you're looking at when it comes to a coin and how it's been graded. Uh I think generally speaking the third party grading services get it right when they grade coins. I mean most of the stuff that comes in you can't really argue it too much. I mean most of it's it's accurate, right? So it can be a good tool for someone to learn how to grade, but the problem is they're not learning how to grade no matter how many times I put eight times eight and it's 64, I can't remember it's 64. I still have to hit eight times eight on the calculator. And so um, when, if you're a collector and you want to put together a really nice collection of stuff, you need to yeah, be aware of what the grade is on the coin, but also you need to be able to focus on um, understanding if the coin is really nice, if it's going to appeal to a broad range of people, if it has a better look to it than a coin would um, in that same grade naturally. Um, but I would, I would love for people to learn better how to grade. And if you're collecting, you need to know how to grade for lots of different reasons. Um, but, but not be intimidated about it. It's really not that hard. Some of my favorite videos I've done are just basic grading videos where I literally use like a whiteboard and it's all theoretical. Like it's not, it's not this big, scary, what, where's this line? Where's this line on the coin? It's more of like, okay, we understand the concept of uncirculated. We understand the concept of this thing is worn to nothing. And then you're just putting things in brackets so that almost anyone, if you've looked at a lot of coins, can pretty closely grade just about any coin. Uh, but a lot of that comes with the seeing coins, which gets me back to getting out to a local shows and getting out to um, your local shop if you have it. Because the more coins you can look at, the more you can train your eye. So that's just another thing about getting to coin club, getting to coin shows and getting to your local shop. Um, you know, the more stuff you look at, the more you'll know. Okay, then we have two questions left in the Q&A at the moment. So for any viewers, go ahead and send in any last questions you have, because otherwise we'll be wrapping it up after these two. Just wanted to give some warning. Um, so 
I think research is of utmost importance. The fear of missing out is a constant in the coin hobby, so research is key. But is that fear of missing out a magnet that could get collectors in trouble? Oh, so um, y- yes. <laughs> the, 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 so the fear of missing out. So I think what they're they're getting at is um, something that I actually didn't really mention that I kind of put in my notes, which is. Um, you know, don't, don't chase trends generally speaking. And it's kind of hard to know sometimes what a trend is. Cause like there's certain things that like, maybe, maybe it'll just stay forever. But then all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I went straight to fear of missing out you know, FOMO as the kids say. Right. So it's like, I went straight to like, Oh no, I got to buy this. Cause they keep going up in value. And then I'm going to, usually if you see something like really start to take off in value, that's when you're seeing something that might just be kind of a, a short term trend, you know, um, I, I saw that with recently with, with toners and with older holders and certain things that all of a sudden they weren't anywhere near as popular three or four years ago. And then all of a sudden they just went, went kind of crazy. I will say also, I mean, I've made videos about, um, coin envy and that's, that's a video worth it. If you just search like coin envy on YouTube, you can find that. Because, you know, the, the commentary, your introduction, which I think you kind of snickered out when I said I like humanity, um, because not many people do, I guess. But, you know, you get the chance to, un- there's there's like so much that goes into coin collecting that's not the coins, it's the people. And like, we forget about that. And so the question I really appreciate is this, this fear of missing out question, because uh, there's a lot of collectors that are motivated by that type of thing. And, you know, uh, we spoke about, people getting overwhelmed just going to a small coin show, let alone a large one. Uh, So one of the things that we also teach is having a plan, having a collecting path forward, because what you don't want to do is go grocery shopping without a list when you're hungry. And that's exactly what uh, the coin market can be for somebody who doesn't have a plan. So, you know, related to the fear of missing out, you're just chasing stuff to chase it when you can like, you can really dial in and enjoy your hobby. Uh, You know, if you have set up parameters for the things you want to collect, you don't have any fear of missing out anymore because you've already said, I'm not buying all of this stuff. I just, I can just ignore it. I'm not going down the candy aisle. I'm not doing it. I'm only going to do things that fall into this parameter and that's it. And I have a budget and that's it. And that really helps you enjoy collecting and not have to sell stuff off later because you went over budget. (laughs) Okay. um, And then real quickly, we have one uh, that I'm going to take. Will this recorded webinar be available online? Yes. Um, All of them are being recorded. The recordings will be available two to three weeks from Saturday. Um, if you've attended in the past, you know, it's usually two weeks since the Baltimore show is in the middle, it'll probably take a little longer to get the recordings this time. Um, but if you got the email this morning about nine 15 saying we were about to start, you will get an email when those recordings are available. Um, otherwise you can sign up for emails on our website or just keep an eye on the website and there'll be an announcement there when they're available as well. Um, and same on our social media. So yes. Will that be on, uh, so the videos will be available both on directly on your website and also put out on YouTube, or are they just going to direct to the website? Um, direct- they are, they're all on the NNP, the Newman Numismatic Portal. Um, and then we just kind of link to there from our website. Um, okay. If you, you Ben, the presenter, want to put it up on YouTube, you are more than welcome to download it and upload it to your own channel. Um, okay. That's totally fine. You can do whatever you please with it. Um, Sounds good. So. Good deal. Okay. And then we do have some more questions in here. So you're not off the hook yet. (laughs) Uh, What are some red flags that let a collector know that he or she is potentially facing a bad or untrustworthy coin dealer? Conversely, what are some green flags that should give a collector comfort? Um, Well, reputation is a real thing. I think that, um, and I don't mean like Google and Yelp reviews, because those can be manipulated pretty easily and once again this is about being in a trusted community of people um uh i think that if you are already a tune 
to how humanity works, you should be able to navigate this in a natural way. In other words, it's kind of like when you went to go buy a car and you just decided, yeah, I'm just not feeling it. Like, I'm not going to deal with this guy. You will get that at certain places where if you're going to deal with somebody, um, you'll just know, you know, it's just not for me. Like I, you can pick, there's lots of coin dealers out there. You can pick and choose who you want to deal with. Um, what happens, I think more in our, our current economy is that because there's so many sellers that are not really, uh, what you necessarily call a dealer per se, but they're selling in these more modern outlets. So like an Instagram, uh, or Facebook, and they don't do anything but sell on the electro electronic media platforms. Um, red flags are always what they've been, which is to say, if it's too good to be true, then it's, you know, you should, you should avoid it. So if, if someone's trying to sell you a coin and it looks like it's a fraction of the value, that's, that's a red flag. Um, you know, uh, you can spot, I think for me, spotting green flags is an interesting question. You know, I'm jumping back and forth between in-person versus um, like like on an electronic platform because it's kind of harder sometimes to tell the difference. But on in-person, uh, you can see how someone treats uh, a kid at a coin show like 100%. Like I've, you know, we got someone coming to our Tucson coin show in January, a dealer out of California that I met them at uh, Central States. And I saw how he interacted with kids coming up to the table. I'm like, I want him at my coin show. You know, like that is, that's what you want. Mm -hmm. And so a green flag is like, if you go into a shop and people are engaging and friendly, like that's a good sign. Right. And so, um, you know, but if, if you go in there and they just kind of ignore, ignore you, and especially if they are like upset that you brought kids in with you, that's, uh, that's kind of a turn off for me. So. All right. With better coins, scarce coins and high grade being so expensive today, where should a collector with limited budget start with the goal of having his collection turn into an investment? There's the investment question. There's an investment question. <laughs> well, I laugh at the investment question because I'm like, I, whenever people ask me the investment question, I give them an answer they don't like. And they'll be like, you know, oh, you're, you're not really, that's not really what I wanted to hear. So I'm going to ignore it. You know, but I, I, there's plenty of really cool coins uh, that are global international coins to get into that I consider to have smaller markets uh, currently that could have larger markets later on down the road. Um, as far as I mean, his I mean, his question really about 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 budgets and buying coins uh, long term. Uh, so first of all, I love humanity. So I'm going to say, you know, work on your actual personal budget, which is to say, like if you get your financial house in order, well, you know, kind of streamline things, you know, get out of debt and have a budget. You, you'd be amazed at how much more money you have. You know, one of the reasons that our hobby really blew up during COVID was because people stopped going out to eat. And the average American is spending like a thousand dollars a month on eating out. They have no idea because they don't do a budget. They have no idea. And then so during COVID, when they couldn't go out, all of a sudden they're like, I got this money I can spend. So they went to Home Depot and they went and bought coins online. And, you know, but that money's already there now still, but because we just spend it everywhere. You know, so making your hobby a priority in your budget is one thing where you can increase the amount of money you have to spend on things, first of all. Uh, and when it comes to actual coins that you can buy, um, man, it's such a broad, broad subject. Um, one of the things that I find uh, interesting is when you look at a little bit of population support. I'm not known as a pop population support kind of guy, but, um, you know, I was just looking at two coins that, you know, one has a population a fifth, you know, 20% as large as the other one. And yet their price points are the same. I'm like, huh, I think I'm going to take the one that has the 20% cut. So in, in general, uh, there's scarcity and there's some scarcity now because of population reports that gives you a quick view into the scarcity. 
Whereas what I want to say is you use your gut. But if you don't look at coins all day for 25 years, what's your gut attuned to, right? Like Reese's peanut butter cups, like they should be. But like, you're not going to know exactly what um, is scarce or not scarce. Like for me, when I buy world coins that I, if I see a coin that I haven't seen in 15 years, I'm like, oh, and you know, it's like a couple hundred bucks. I'm like, oh, okay, well. I, I think about that and I compare that to a silver eagle that they made 700000 of that's $250. I'm like, no, yes. Like, give me give me the esoteric item, the strange item. Um, and this is also just an investment strategy. If you've ever listened to at all Warren Buffett talk, he's a guy with a lot of money if you haven't heard about him. And so like his stuff has always just been countercultural, which is to say, you go where other people aren't going. And so that might involve getting into markets that have been depressed for a while. So people don't want to buy into them. They're like, you know, who needs another, you know, who, who really wants a, a V nickel? Sorry, V nickel guys. I love V nickels. So, um, but, you know, but there's, so going into areas that there aren't as many collectors because eventually you don't need that many more collectors to go into the marketplace to make the value go up. You can check scarcity based on pop reports if you want to. But also, if you're really into the market a lot, you start to see things that you never, if you see something you've never seen before, it's like, okay, you can kind of get at value. When I evaluate coins, it's oftentimes with that mindset of compared to the overall market, like my example of the Silver Eagle being $250, or I could buy this, that this or that mentality is actually something that I use a lot kind of subconsciously when I'm looking at coins and thinking about whether to buy something that I think someone else would enjoy. All right. Um, this one, I think we have kind of two questions happening here, but they go together. Um, how do I learn to sell? I keep accumulating, but need to move duplicates. How do I learn to let go? Okay. Um, right? Uh, yes. And there's a thousand things in my garage that I can't get rid of, even though they're worthless. Um, so this question is is all about like, yeah, letting go is hard. Letting go is hard. So one of the things that's helpful for me for letting go of things is thinking about what I'm going to use the money for. So having a goal. Uh, a second thing is understanding what the real wholesale value of something is. So I have no idea what type of stuff they've accumulated or have. You can go the route of trying to sell everything yourself, whether it's on eBay or Instagram or what have you. Um, depending on the volume of stuff, if it's not a lot of stuff, selling it person to person, going to coin, coin clubs uh, and coin shows and trying to sell on eBay. If you don't have a lot of items, there's that. If you have a lot of stuff, I still recommend finding someone who will buy it all wholesale, which means they're going to they're gonna do the labor of reselling something. When you sell something wholesale, you may think my item's worth $100 and this guy only wants to give me 65 or 80 or 50, whatever the number is. He's taking money from me. But what he's doing is you're paying him for his labor, right? That's actually what's happening. And as soon as you try to sell all of your stuff on eBay, you will understand why it's perfectly fair to sell somebody uh, who's willing to buy your stuff you're trying to get rid of. And he's willing to pay you whatever that number is, depending on how liquid something is. You know, maybe it's only half of what you perceive the value at, but maybe it's 75, 85%. If it's a nice certified coin, it might be that closer margin. Whereas if it's something that's really kind of an everyday bulk item, that number is going to be lower. But the reality is, if you take all of that stuff and it's just sitting there, it's kind of like you took money and you just nailed it to the wall and it's just sitting there. It's just dead money right now, right? And and so I recommend thinking about it that way is like, I'm going to take all that money that's just sitting here and I'm going to go buy that item I've always wanted. And so I have a lot of guys that I know that they'll spend $100 a month on something and then say they can't afford a $500 coin. And I always think, well, you can, you just need to have some discipline. And what's nice if you've accumulated a lot of extras and if your average coin price is like, you know, $50 or something. And you've always wanted a $500 coin and you've always said, I can't afford that. Now, wait a second. 
look at all this piles of stuff that you have that you aren't really enjoying anymore. It's okay to say, I don't enjoy this anymore. It's okay to say, you know what, proof sets, we had our moment. It's time. You know, if you need a little ceremony and say goodbye, go ahead and do that. But but the reality is it's helpful for me to say, I'm going to sell this item, which I really enjoy. And I've sold items I really enjoy because I knew I was putting that money towards something that I wanted more. All right. I think we are once again down to two questions left in the Q&A. Um, there are a couple statements here, which are just stating an opinion, um, which we're not going to share. But thank you for your contributions. <laughs> Uh, as far as questions, uh, how much impact do you think CAC grading will have on the coin market? What do you think about their performance so far? So CAC grading, it'll be interesting to see. So when CAC stickering came out, I was of the opinion of like, this is really stupid. That was my opinion. And I told people all the time, I'm like, this is dumb. Like, what are they doing here? Um, you know, it really honestly wasn't until a few years ago that I was like, okay, I understand why people like this in the marketplace. And so, but it took me years to get to there. And I have no idea exactly how CAC grading is going to do in the long run. Um, I know that they're competent. I know that they're capable. Uh, I think that they'll probably be pretty consistent, you know, because that's, you just kind of know from what they've set up, who they are. I mean, they've, it's easy to, to look and understand. They've said, this is our grading team and this is what we're doing. Um, you know, so far we've only had a few coins graded. And actually, um, it's the results have been mixed for us. But also, that's a lot of times I get coins graded. The results are mixed for us. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's definitely there is a long term, long term wait and see approach, which is kind of the message for lots of things today. It's like, what is the actual long term going to be? In the short term, it's like everyone's very reactionary and like, oh, this is terrible or oh, this is amazing. And I don't know exactly how it's going to play out. I do think that competition is good for every marketplace. And when you have competition, it benefits everybody. And so when we have an open market, um, I mean, the best thing you can have is open market competition and stuff. I don't know what a market will be or what it is. Like we want, when we talk about a market, like the coin market, it's like, it's like this tangible thing, right? And we think about that with coin grading too. Like it's this tangible thing. But the reality is like, where people will move with their affinity, it, you don't know over the long run. So when you think about what CAC did with the stickering, there were first adopters who are always crazy people. And, and it was really very slow growth for them. And then you look up 15 years later and you're like, you can overnight success, right? And so that's the type of thing where you, you can easily jump to conclusions on, on any of these things. But uh, I, I don't really know where it'll where it'll end up. I know, that, like I said, they're competent, and capable. Uh, what the market will perceive is their need in the marketplace. We'll just kind of have to wait and see exactly how that plays out. But I'm mm -hmm. I'm excited about like where we're at in the market in general, just because you know, for there's a lot of people who get involved in like the politics and the personalities and this and that and the other. And I'm like, I'm just sitting here like this is really interesting because. For most of my coin collecting life, it was kind of like, it felt like it was just the same old, you know, the market was a little boring, so to speak. And now to me, this is all kind of like a little excitement, uh, you know, for a coin geek anyways. <laughs> okay, then possibly the last question. Um, where should you not take coins to sell them? Pawn shops and hotel setups come to mind. Well, I mean, this, the answering your own question. Um, <laughs> The hard part for me is that most of the people that watch this already know the answers to those questions, I think. Um, not, I'm not picking on the question. I'm just saying like it pains me that the guys that set up at hotels continue to do business in this day and age and just prey on people. Um, and so naturally, if you have, have coins um, you know, and coins or paper money or things of that nature, um, you know, we talk a lot about reputation and, and, and looking around, but, but definitely you don't want to go, uh, don't do your own yard sale until you get some information. Don't, uh, don't go to anyone who's just a pawn shop. Don't go to, of course, the, um, 
the guys that are fly by night and set up at, set up at shows, uh, just set, set up in the hotels. Um, you know, there's there's just a whole lot of that. It, in this is an unfair statement. I'm going to qualify my statement ahead of time. It's an unfair statement I'm about to make. If they spend a lot on advertising, probably not the place to go. And I, I say that kind of like as someone who has a store and just understands what marketing costs and understands where they get the money to pay for the marketing, right? So, um, and I say it's unfair because there's probably plenty of really nice guys that do marketing and that's a part of their thing or they do advertising, you know, but I just know from my experience of the last 25 years, the guys who say we pay more and they blast the TV are oftentimes not the guys who pay more. Uh, that's just not a thing. So, uh, thanks for the time. Also, go ahead. If, hey, I don't care how negative those comments are and what they think about me. You could probably go ahead and read them anyways. Like that would that would be. It, they were um, room. It, let me find them again. Um, they, they, no, no, no. It's okay. Do what you want to do, but the, if they're outtakes, you can make the outtake. Can we have a blooper reel for the NNP? <laughs> no, it was just ruminating on. Um, different like types of coins and the value of collecting proofs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I just, the way you, the way you phrased it, I was like, uh Oh, we got, we got <laughs> some haters out there throwing the hater aid around. No, no. I know we've received some feedback in the past of people saying, you know, my question wasn't read out and we just try very hard to keep the Q and a a Q and a and not let's just toss opinions back and forth. Um, so like for people watching, if you want to follow up um, and want to talk to Ben about something, you're welcome to email us and I'll happily forward that along. Um, but for the actual presentations, we try to keep it a Q and a, so yeah, yeah. it's a concept. <laughs> um, okay. Then we don't have anything else in the Q and a for now. Um, so I think that's going to wrap us up. Um, thank you everyone for asking so many questions. That was a very lively Q and a session, which was great. Um, and thank you, Ben, for taking time out bright and early this morning. <laughs> It's awesome. It, yeah, I thanks so much for doing this and for your contribution. I know that it's uh, it's actually a lot of work to set this up. And so I appreciate that you're the one who's dealing with all the technology. And uh, you're welcome for me not presenting a lot of slides. <laughs> Made my life very easy. <laughs> um, okay, so for viewers, um, we'll be back starting in about 15 minutes with Dror Goldberg um, talking about American Puritans and the invention of modern currency. Um, so just go back to that schedule page on our website and follow the link right into that one. Um, hope you will continue to join us throughout the next three days. And just a reminder, we will be starting an hour and a half later for Friday and Saturday. Um, today we started at 9.30 Eastern or starting at 11 Eastern for the next two days. So won't have to get up quite so early to catch the first one. Um, but that's all I've got. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ben. And hope Cheers. you have Thank a you. great rest of the symposium. <laughs> Take care.